Okay, hello, my name is Darcy Logan, and I am the Gallery Services Manager at CASA, a community art centre located in Lethbridge, in the heart of Treaty 7 territory, the traditional lands of the Blackfoot people. I would first like to acknowledge the Blackfoot, Indigenous, and Métis people past and present who are the stewards of this land. We are excited to be presenting the documentary Intertribal by Siksika artist and filmmaker Trevor Solway. Intertribal showcases the talents of a quartet of Indigenous musicians from the Treaty 7 area. The quartet of Indigenous musicians from the Treaty 7 area, Armin Duck Chief, Baby Buckskin, Darcy Turning Robe, and Olivia Tailfeathers. So I will first uh, introduce a little bit about uh, Trevor. Trevor Solway Sinaxon is a Blackfoot filmmaker from Siksika Nation. Trevor attended the Independent Indigenous Digital Filmmaker Program at Capilano University in 2012. He then graduated from Mount Royal University with his Bachelor's of Communications in 2017. In 2020, Trevor was a recipient of the Mount Royal University Alumni Award for his early career success. Trevor has self-produced and directed various short narrative and documentaries that have screened at Calgary International Film Festival, Imagine Native Arts and Media Festival, and Big Sky Documentary Film Festival. Trevor is the founder of the Nopi Collective, a mentorship filmmaking society based in Siksika. From 2018 to 2020, Trevor mentored 18 emerging Indigenous filmmakers from his community to write, direct, shoot, and edit four narrative films, which screened in their community and abroad at Indigenous film festivals such as the American Indian Film Festival, LA Skins, and Moraland Film Festival. In 2019, Trevor appeared on CBC's Standing, Still Standing, and was interviewed by Johnny Harris about his filmmaking mentorship initiatives with the Nopi Collective. In the fall of 2020, Trevor has had his, had his broadcast debut for CBC for his documentary, Intertribal. Today is our first National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. It is a day of gravity and reflection. CASA is honored to celebrate artists in our region by sharing Trevor's film. The documentary is approximately 45 minutes, after which we will invite Trevor to speak and answer questions which uh, may come, have come in the chat. Um, this screening was originally meant to be our first in-person screening after a, a long hiatus having suspended in-person things here at CASA. But due to the current health crisis, we have made the choice to pivot this to being online. Um, I would like to thank the Alberta Media Arts Alliance Society and their generous grant, which allowed us to present this film to you. And thanks, uh, Trevor Solway. And I think we will uh, start the film. Thanks. <laughs> Growing up in uh, Clooney, my family particularly, they were country music lovers, so like every household basically is playing George Jones. I remember from, those are the fondest memories, like George Jones would be playing, I, I'll go to my house, my auntie's house, kind of, we all live on that same stretch of road, so every house I would go to, there'd be some country music playing, and then with my um, dad, when we travel to rodeos and there, he would be playing all kinds of country music, like 
Sammy Kershaw, Alan Jackson, Waylon Jennings, the Beyond Repeat, you know, George Jones. So I grew up listening to country music and I grew up uh, just loving that sound, the steel guitar and the fiddle. Jeez, the last time I seen you, Darcy, you're about this tall. <laughs> <laughs> no, we go way back, right? Uh, from hockey, I think we started playing. Uh, I, I met you at um, treaties or provincials, one of the two. Yeah. And then I remember, I just, geez, I really had to help your performance, you know. Pass you the puck. <laughs> kidding. No, we played hockey together, and then uh, yeah, we started singing power together. So we've yeah. been uh, we've been at it for uh, quite some time. Yeah. As in country music, how has that inspired you to become a you know, country singer and a songwriter. When I started actually performing, it was your dad that gave me my first shot. It was like, um, I told him, I'm, I'm, I'm playing the guitar now. You know, this was back in like 2004 and he had that jamboree for- uh, Oh yeah, my uh, grandfather. Yeah, so, yeah. so anyways, I went to go watch, right? And then, and then he's like, he said, oh, this next artist is gonna, he's up and coming and then all this. And I'm thinking, oh, who's this gonna be? You know, next thing he said, Armin Dutch. He was like, what? So I go up to him, I was like, Frank, I only know how to sing one song. He's like, hey, Pat, gives me the guitar. Sing that one. One, two, three, four. <laughs> Ready? Yeah. Slide on a little sweet thing. Don't pull out my six strings. Sing a song. Right, so he gives me my first shot. So it was right since then, since I started like uh, practicing with the guitar, working on songs, I wanted to write my own songs. So that's kind of where it was, it was like the, the idea was kind of born. When I was getting these shows, singing everyone else's songs, um, they were going good, but I wanted to sing my own song. I wanted to write my own song, so I tried it. Songwriting just kind of came with my love of uh, poetry and then just being able to put it together. Pao singing really helped me uh, develop my voice, you know, use it in a way where yeah. I can I can uh, sing with the guitar and throw my voice around. Because uh, in Pao, you know, like, yeah. it takes a lot of, uh, like, your, you have cer certain muscles that help us sing. Yeah. And it just kind of made that transition a little easier into country music. And then the songwriting was just, yeah, because I kind of got sick of uh, singing everyone else's songs. <laughs> yeah. What was it like growing up in Six Year? It was awesome. Like, all my, uh, we grew up on the Clooney side of things, and it was uh, many nights spent uh, riding bikes all hours of the night, or just uh, down in Chicago, it was uh, playing on the hills and the trees. Back then, we didn't have, uh, you know, iPods or Nintendos, all that kind of stuff. So we, yeah, growing up was just uh, awesome here in Six Ago, just exploring the reserve and just uh, a living, you know. How do you think uh, the community uh, adapted to your sound of uh, country music? Oh yeah, like Six Ago has been one of my biggest supporters. You know, they've uh, kind of welcomed me with open arms. Like I, my first shows were here in Six Ago with you. Like we played uh, a show in Calgary, I believe, and. Ever since then, they've just kind of supported my my dreams and my endeavors. As far as music goes, I mean, everybody here in Sixaga has been really um, receptive to the music and just kind of supports it. You know, they're always making compliments, uh, um, you know, telling me that they're proud of me, and I'm grateful for that. Sixaga has actually been the one that uh, helped get the albums off the ground. You know, so it was. They're a real big supporter. The community has just uh, backed me. You know, 100 uh, percent with my family and just everybody. They're just, um, and I'm just proud to be, you know, from here and get to represent Six Cigar and the way I, I get to when I'm going out to these different communities sharing my music. So yeah. it's, uh, it means a lot. And mm -hmm. the, the support that I get from the, the reserve here is awesome. is awesome. I think that's a really good thing what you're giving back to the community, especially for the youth. My work here, I work at, this, at the school, 
I'm a mentorship coach, so I get to bring in programs. So, yeah. you know, investing my um, time and my experience back into the nation. Yeah, so I see that we're in the Sixiga Rodeo Center, you know. Oh, what does this mean to you? Like, what is this? Uh, do you find this home or what is it uh, for you? Is it the meaning? Yeah, like rodeo for me is just, uh, you know, something I absolutely love to do. I sing about it, um, you know, I, I go to sleep thinking about it. I, with this arena, it's going to pick up the sport of rodeo here in Sixaga. And I want to be a part of that to help youth get into the sport and revive it somewhat. We could use more, you know, cowboys and cowgirls. So. started out as, this is a jam, I was just jamming out in my downtime as I was going to college in Lethbridge. And then I just, you know, threw together a little bit of a love song because I was madly in love at the time. I still am. <laughs> so tell me what I gotta do to make your dreams come true. Girl, I do it all the time. Let me whisper in your ear All the things you want to hear I just got to make mine so Every good girl needs a good man My grandfather used to tell me, when you're in the river, you offer tobacco when you're, uh, you're grieving or you're thinking of you're being lost or you're, you're just losing train of thought. The creator had a different language, just like singing and power singing. The river has its own language with us.
Grandpa used to tell me there's a you, it's the beta be you in your spirit. It's always with you. You know, you gotta feed it. You know, you gotta protect them. So it's, it's, it all means good, and there's good spirits here. There's our ancestors, this is where we go, they say. So there's a lot of meaning. What's your Indian name, bro? My Indian name is uh, at gunpoint, Nam Hukamata. I got that from uh, Mark Wolflake Sr. from my grandfather, Frank Turnerow. The team of Kutupi gave me that name. It's a war story because they both went to World War II together mm. and they were survivors and many, many different little stories that, of that name. So my name is Nam Hukamata at gunpoint. Oh, it's a cool name. So I've known you for a long time now. We played hockey together back in Pee Wee. We've sang together. We've traveled together. Like we hung out and you know, we've just been going at it for a long time. You're one of the main inspirations when I started singing when I was very young. When I used to live in Calgary, born and raised. When I used to go down to reserve, you were the first person to ask me to come sing. I used to have a group called Six of God Boys. SBZ yeah. back in the day is the lead singer. So what was it like growing up here in the city, in Calgary? In the city, it was pretty tough. You know, I kind of felt like I wasn't a part of the city. I was kind of felt like I was, uh, I wasn't, I felt like I didn't belong. You know, I started living a different lifestyle, but I started learning my culture through my dad and my grandfather. You know, you came in my life and a big influence of uh, getting me out of that uh, dangerous lifestyle in the city. So being in the city, how did you stay connected to your culture? Me and my dad goes, well, we live in the city. We can't go to reserve. Let's make a power drum. We made a power drum in our backyard. Neighbors are all looking at us. And that was the first time I actually had proud. I was proud of who I was yeah. because the neighbors are just looking. And, you know, there was a big uh, educational for them. And not only that for myself. And my dad always talked to me taught me the, the ways and the songs. And my grandfather, he was part of the uh, the Kito Kik Society. Mm -hmm. So that was a big uh, impact in my life of just being connected with culture. And So what is it about this place right here that, you know, really <clears throat> gets to you, really makes you yeah, feel good? This, this place right here, man, this is like home for me. You know, like I'm born and raised in the city. Mm -hmm. And we come down here, my family, my grandfather was the first one to bring me down here and we did an offer to the river and we were just having a little bit of uh, good fortune, but he said, you gotta be thanks for that. Mm -hmm. You can't just keep going on, you know? So this is, means a lot to me, you know? When I look over to this, on the horizon, I look over the cliff, I call on creator, I tell grandfather, look at the city, it's changing. It's beautiful, you know, just for to have that relationship with my grandfather miss him to miss him a lot still yeah. you know and that's what gives me joy because uh he's the main one that taught me how to sing and uh he made me lead when i was eight years old mm -hmm. <laughs> for the attorney rope singers so now today i'm the lead singer of the group so yeah. so it goes along i'm the fifth generation i know you guys like the turning rope singers you guys have your own unique sound like with drumming and singing like how as blackfoots how do we like how does our sound differ from other tribes in the powwow uh, Blackfoot style singing, like you said, is different. Uh, we have a different, different drumming. You know, it's like if you back in the old days, like um, it's like a rhythm and blues. You know, that's the best way I can look at it. It's a real traditional, not too high, not too low, just real loud. A lot of uh, like a lot of uh, opera singing, a lot of vocalizing. Yeah. So. We've never changed our style, mm -hmm. Blackfoots. It's always been that way and we just kept going with it. So I know, like I'm the fifth generation, you know, I've never changed it, so. So yeah, I know you've been singing like right from a young age. So what is it that keeps you singing? Um, really, I just love traveling mm -hmm. and sharing my music and uh, sharing my new songs and just keeping reminding uh, the youth that were still around. Blackfoot style is still here. I love uh, being out there with the youth and showing this youth another way, another door, you know, for them to uh, to experience. 
you know, like singing has saved me in many different ways, you know. Um, like I said, uh, it has a different, it has, brings me a better connection to Creator. You know, every time I'm singing, it just gives me a feel like I'm doing something right. I'm thinking of all the people that are on the streets or in the hospitals or just living a rough lifestyle. Yeah. And when I'm singing hard, I think of them all the time. You know, that's what keeps me coming. And I feel I get something out of it. If I wasn't feeling like I was getting anything out of it, I, maybe I wouldn't be a singer. But I feel like I get tremendous joy off it. Mm -hmm. And it's just uh, it's just something I can't explain, you know. It's, it just feels like I have a better connection with a higher power at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's deep. Thanks for sharing all that with me, bro. It's just uh, it's good to hear that right. that stuff. Awesome, thank you. You bet. This is spared a moment right, right at the river. Almost like when I dropped it down there, I just looked up. Creator asked him uh, for guidance and uh, good spirits and good good medicine, I guess you would call it. And um, I was sitting there, and when that wind blew at me, is this something came in me? And I was like, oh, that was, and I started singing it. It just, it just already wrote itself. It's a different language, my grandpa said, eh? When you sing a song, we don't understand what we're saying, but the creator, it's a language. I call it my, uh, my baby girl song as a single father of three girls. It's a round dance song. It's also a very healing song. It means a lot to me. And I always sing that. Every round dance I go to is a feeling. It, uh, it, it, it gives everybody energy. Or it gives everybody a soothing feeling. Just something about that song. There was one time that uh, there's a story about Ami Okotoki. There was a hunter in Umita Pesio along that ridge. And he saw a man come down into the coolie. And he, he thought to himself, that must be Red Medicine Pipe Man. I'm going to follow him down. Ami Nitutan, the river. He crossed the river. And he came up to this area right here. And he thought that, he was wondering, where did uh, 
the red medicine pipe man go because that's who he was following. This hunter was looking for healing. And so he was determined to find him. And he came around this area. He didn't even, where did he go? He's, I can't see him anywhere. So the hunter was quite tired, you know, that evening because he was hunting all day. And he decided that he was going to have a rest. Gami, uh, this rock here, which has ochre on it, red ochre. He decided that he was going to lay down. And so he lay down and he, you know, smoked his tobacco. So the hunter fell asleep. He uh, started dreaming. And when he started dreaming, the red medicine pipe man came to him in his dream. And he was told, take that uh, tobacco and give an offering. I am the rock that you're sleeping next to. It is my spirit. And I'm asking you to uh, give an offering to the rock so that there could be peace and harmony in this world for generations to come. And so Red Medicine Pipe Man looked at the rock and it, he saw the vision of, of a man with a blanket. And Red, Red Medicine Man told the hunter in his dream, give an offering, give a peace offering to Chach Goy. And so Red Medicine Pipe Man told him, put it to the earth. It is why we are here on, on earth. So, to be peaceful and gentle. And so that is why we give offerings. These are only one of the stories. We have thousands of legends the Blackfeet have and they all have a motto in all the stories. And this is one very good motto for peace in the world.
beautiful day here in Lethbridge. It's gorgeous. Um, yeah, first things first, my mm -hmm. name is Bibi Buckskin. Yes, so I'm a musician. Okay. Yeah, nice to meet you. Um, I'm from Palo Prairie Métis Settlement up north. Yes, okay. And um, yeah, music is my passion and I'm sure it's yours as well. And this is why we're here. So yeah. Um, yeah, if you can tell me a little bit about yourself. Okay, so I would like to first acknowledge the land here. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's Blackfoot Territory. And uh, we have the, the water right here, and uh, mm -hmm. this, is a, this place holds a lot of history, you know, for our people, because mm -hmm. we've been here for thousands and thousands of years. Mm -hmm. And so we're very connected to the land, and I think that's where, you know, uh, my appreciation for music comes from, is also right. from the, our, our, our land here. Do you have any particular influences um, regarding your music? A lot of my uh, music world started when I was very, very young, and I would spend time at the uh, Sundance. It's our annual uh, prayer time with our different societies, mm -hmm. and uh, so I spent a lot of time there as a young girl. And uh, I remember waking up early in the morning, and we get, uh, you know, a blessing. We get uh, mm -hmm. our faces painted, you know, yeah. with, with ochre and prayers. A lot of that, you know, that was part of my growing up was living yeah. in that world. Yeah. And the other is uh, having to attend uh, a residential school. My father was a, a school teacher there. Yeah. And so uh, I listened to a lot of uh, church music. Okay. Yeah, so I okay. listened to a lot of the European music. Yeah. It's like living in two worlds, and so my whole family was involved in, in singing. Your music is sort of a mix of new and old, um, traditional and like more contemporary sounds. How how has that journey been for you mixing like these these two genres together? I can relate back into uh, when I first started teaching on the Blood Reserve, and I realized that there was something missing in the classroom, mm -hmm. and uh, we had the, our music curriculum, and so I decided uh, you know to pick up the drum, <laughs> mm -hmm. and, uh, and just you know as a rhythm instrument, and that's how I started playing around with the music and. Just, you know, stomping and, mm -hmm. and creating that rhythm. So that really helped with, the, you know, the, I guess, the creation of song. Because yeah. you have to have rhythm. Yeah. And yeah, so I, then I started adding Blackfoot to the words. I guess, you know, connecting to the land with, with yeah. Blackfoot language. Mm -hmm. And so I started creating songs for the children. Right. So that we could feel the words of the, of the, the magic of the word. Right. So, so it was the... It was, it, was, it was an organic sort of thing for you, just kind of unfolded naturally and organically. And yeah, you know, that word organic, yeah. I like that. <laughs> yeah, beautiful. Yeah, no, I can relate yeah. to that. Also, could you elaborate about um, the land, the beautiful land that we're on? I'd like to know a little bit about your roots here. So just like to mention that uh, the songs that have been uh, given to me as a, as a gift through listening to the land and they say the cosmos, that the mm -hmm. songs are, everybody has a song. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, just, you know, appreciation uh, to the people who've helped to carry the music on, you know, yeah. and uh, all the people that uh, partake in, in accepting culture and yeah. accepting change for the, for the betterment of the, you know, the whole musical world. We'll call it right. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's it's great to be a part of that whole movement. You know, mm -hmm. we're we're doing this together, we're rising together, mm -hmm. and it's it's a great feeling to be part part of that movement. Yes, you know. And so. the best thing is passing it on to the young people and uh, being proud of who you are as you know mm -hmm. uh, First Nations people. Yeah. I was just kind of like taking a midday snooze, and uh, the wind kind of blew in and. It blew the curtains in this rhythmic way, and then through that came melody. Push now, baby, don't you say anymore. I'm zipping on my boots, dancing out that door. Won't kill time, won't kill the trail. Try to drop me like an animal. Drops never touch my tail. 
Oh, I got a compass hard and leather on my feet. You've been lying about the sun, now you'll never find me when darkness falls. Teach on right. If you try to jump me down, but I know you're in the fight of your life. It happened like totally organic. Like it just, it kind of like it wrote itself. And I was just like a, a conduit for that to happen. So I want to ask you first, um, where are you from? Paddle Prairie Métis Settlement is uh, where Prairie. I was born and raised. Like, I loved growing up in the country. Mm -hmm. um, like we always had horses. I come from a big rodeo family. Wow, that's so, awesome. So um, I drew a lot of inspiration from that. Like, yes. You know, like I, I love old time country music. Yes. Um, I draw a lot of inspiration from that side of my life. I, l I can relate to that because I grew yeah. up as, as a horse a cowgirl. Yeah. I, yeah. I rode horses also. Oh, you did? Okay. Yes, I know that's where that, a lot of that rhythm development comes from. Yeah. And riding and, and yeah. listening to the rhythm of the hoof. I'd also like to find out where your influences uh, of music came from and how you grew up with the, the music from your area and, and all the different influences that you have. Um, well, music definitely runs in my family. Like mm -hmm. I said, my grandfather plays fiddle and guitar. My mother is also um, a singer, songwriter. Wow. Um, she does awesome. a lot of gospel music. So she, yes. I grew up listening to a lot of gospel, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of country, a lot of old school rock and roll from my dad. Oh, great. And, uh, yeah. yeah, so it was just kind of a, like an amalgamation of different genres and mm -hmm. um, also having it run in my family. Yeah. I feel like it's it's my passion, but it's also my responsibility mm -hmm. to carry it on and, and, you know, pass it on to my children. That's great motivation for, mm -hmm. you know, who you are and where you come from. Mm -hmm. And I like how you mentioned about the amalgamation. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like uh, creates uh, a new, almost a new uh, native genre of music. I feel like when I'm on stage performing, I feel, I feel very proud. Mm -hmm. I feel very free mm -hmm. um, and also like being an indigenous front person you yes. know of a rock and roll band there's not a whole lot of like aboriginal like Janis Joplin type yeah. musicians yeah. out there so I think that's mm -hmm. something really cool that I could share <laughs> I'm not afraid to, to get out there and to like mm -hmm. get in people's faces with my music. I'm, I'm kind of like a crazy dancey kind of front oh, front person. Awesome. So I'm I'm like I have I have no shame. I'm just I'm proud to be who I am. I understand also that you did some uh, busking. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, I'm an avid busker. So could you explain what uh, a busker does? And, yeah. And how you got started in that? Yeah, I basically you just go out on the street and into the street with yeah. your guitar whatever instrument and you just start playing singing and uh sometimes you get good tips like that's how i made my living actually for a while was just wow, through busking that... and that's how i fed my kids and that's how i wow, paid rent that is that's really awesome to hear um that's why i love it so much it's 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 mm -hmm. such a great experience to be able to connect with people on that level and to mm -hmm. feel their appreciation it's a it's a beautiful energy exchange When it, when it comes down to it, it's almost like I, w I would rather be busking on mm -hmm. the street rather than performing on stage. <laughs> That's good to know. That is when I'm most grounded and most yes. connected to the earth and to yes. other people is like when that. I'm just out there on the street with my guitar busking and people are walking by and they're smiling at me and I'm making that connection with them and mm -hmm. it's a lot more intimate. I love performing on stage ass when I can just like let loose and dance around like a crazy like <laughs> yeah. mad woman like a monkey and yeah just like let go you know it's kind of it's like a stress reliever you know mm -hmm. being on stage. Busking keeps me grounded. That's you wonderful. Know? It keeps my ego in check. I think that you you are a great inspiration to younger people when they see you performing. Because mm -hmm. remember, with our people, uh, we were silenced. Yeah. You know, in regards to um, residential schools. Yeah. It's 
Don't be afraid to try something. Yeah. 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 So it's all if, it's, about, yeah. if you have that passion, just go ahead and, and you just know, do it. do it. Yeah. And there's, there's a lot of support um, mm-hmm. out there for Aboriginal artists. And I think um, like we're just, we're rising more than ever now. Um, I feel like it's vital for me to like, you know, do my part in, yeah. in that uh, yeah. with my music. Yeah. You know, I have this platform. I might as well use mm-hmm. it to spread, spread awareness. And yeah. um, we're losing our languages, and that's mm-hmm. it's really frustrating for me because, um, like I myself, like I'm not fluent in Cree, but I would like, I'd, I'd like to be one day. Yeah. And we're actually working on a a song, a blues song that Great. I'm writing in Cree. Awesome! Yeah, so I'd love to hear that. That's going to be awesome. Yeah. Yeah. So to pull that and and bring that into my music, bring like my language into the music is yeah. is really important to me too. I, it was, it's kind of an ode to my grandfather a little bit because he's a trapper. So that's where I got the inspiration trap line and I used it kind of as an analogy about like, um, it's kind of like a big F you to men who try to control me, I guess. Um, yeah, I kind of wrote it like based on a personal relationship that I had as well and just kind of like a big F you to that person and nobody can hold me down or control me. I'm a strong woman and... Um, yeah, like I, I drew inspiration from my, my grandfather being a trapper, and I kind of used that as like a, a template for the song. Now, baby, don't you say anymore. I'm zipping up my boots and sitting out the door. I won't get done, won't get the trail. Try to trap me like an animal. Drops never touch my tail. Oh, I got a compass, hard leather on my feet. Been blinded by the sun. Now you'll never find me when darkness falls. Teeth shine bright. You can try to track me down, but I know you're in the fight of your life. Fight, they will fight for me. I'm gone now, baby. I'm trading you in. I've been a rebel child, the original sin. I don't want to lie. Say I'm blind. If you try to track me down, better know that I run this trap line. Trap line, make it up for long lost time. And I am feeling fine. I gotta run my Frost on the earth, fire in my heart. I'm drying up my drums, loading up my car. The road gets muddy. Once so long, I'll be that high. Never forget my song. Even the whispers from the wind will never tell you where I am, where I am, where I am. Even the tricksters will be on my side. They will fight. Fight, they will fight, they will fight for me. Some real good lighting, Hollywood lighting. <laughs> How come no one's like powdering my nose or anything like that? <laughs> Who's got the powder? Did we not have that in the budget? <laughs> Pow wow! I remember you. Uh, you came to my house the one time and we had some uh, tomato soup and you overloaded the crackers. Take two. (laughs) (laughs) 
Uh, what's the similarities between Powell and uh, country music? Uh, <clears throat> uh. Mm, okay. Okay, do some, what, three different kind of ways of listening. Mm. Yeah. Okay, how about one of just blankly stare at him for like 10 seconds? <laughs> okay, good. Cut. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to say kiss. <laughs> That was a, a really interesting and informative documentary, and I'd like to congratulate and thank uh, Trevor for sharing it with us. And hi, Trevor. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's yeah, nice it's to nice finally, finally we've exchanged, exchanged emails. emails and originally, and originally, I had hoped that maybe we'd have a chance to meet in person, but things are what they are with the health pandemic and restrictions. So I'm yeah. going to. I'm going to maybe just start and uh, just ask you um, uh, by in way of introduction, maybe just how you got started in, in filmmaking and what was your kind of motivation to make that your uh, artistic medium of choice? Yeah, you know, I guess uh, I grew up, uh, you know, I guess my path in filmmaking and, and my destiny, I guess, has always kind of been written. Um, I grew up on a ranch uh, in, in Sixaga, really um, isolated part of Sixaga in the far east end. Didn't really get out a whole lot. I grew up on my my grandpa's ranch, and uh, you know, I just grew up doing a lot of uh, you know ranch like chores and that kind of stuff. Uh, but I always had like this really, you know, kind of crazy imagination and creativity that I always kind of felt like was bottled, and I couldn't ever really express myself. And you know, I didn't grow up with a lot of. Uh, money so i didn't uh, i didn't really start picking up a camera until i was 21 but uh, i was kind of knew i wanted to make films but you know growing up on sixaga and in, in the 90s there wasn't a lot of um like today you have like social media and twitter and instagram and tiktok and you see indigenous people thriving everywhere and if it's in music or in fashion or in, in media and in, in, in anything really but back in the day like you didn't really see a lot of native people doing um things outside of i guess like yeah whatever's on the reserve or hockey or um and i was never really an athletic kid so but i've always been like this super expressive and sensitive kid you know i cried really easily as a kid um yeah so i always wanted to be a filmmaker and then i went to film school in uh when i was about 20 in vancouver um yeah, and I know I, once I kind of really learned the camera, I learned the industry, learned the craft, it really just kind of opened up this this valve and, and of, of these, these this possibility and, and this like energy. And I've just been creating, you know, things nonstop, you know, for about eight years now. Um, so, yeah, I guess, you know, like, you know, being on a ranch and kind of being um, bored all the time kind of like fueled my my passion to, to make films and um, and you know, today I just we just wrapped on a documentary back home on my grandpa's ranch, and it you know, really kind of felt like it came full circle. Like you know, like a lot of the things I had imagined growing up, we we were able to go back and and create them. You know, with the uh, resources we have with cameras and and crew and talent, and so I guess you know those those are my humble beginnings. And you've had uh, support from family and uh, your peers as a as a filmmaker uh yeah like you know like my my grandpa you know i, I kind of think that our, our generation like in the black black people like there's a lot of like this really tough indian cowboy um you know like just growing up in the prairies you know when winters are harsh like there's this we're really resilient and rugged people and my grandpa was like that he uh he worked all the time he was always doing something but he was also really uh believed in story like he would always find time to do, tell a story between chores. And I think maybe in a different time, if he, you know, like he could have been a really great filmmaker, but, you know, growing up in the in the 50s and 60s and 70s, that generation kind of only had 
limited opportunities. Um, and so, yeah, you know, like my grandpa, like he never fully understood what I did as a filmmaker, but he always supported me. Um, and yeah, you know, like uh, Six Siga um, has always, you know, all of my films are based back home and you know, on the reserve. And anytime I need a location or I need any kind of access or I need to interview somebody or I need any kind of help, everyone's just like really um, open to helping me out. And, and, you know, like, I think I've been uh, creating this, this community of filmmakers uh, back home and everyone's just been really helpful in that. Yeah, I'd like to ask you just a little bit about that kind of mentorship role, like the Nopi Collective. Can you speak a little bit about uh, what you're doing with that? Yeah, so the Nopi Collective is a is a filmmaking and mentorship society that we that I started in Six Aga, um back in 2018. Uh, it's like three years now, and we've made six uh, narrative films in that time. And um, and you know, like when I was growing up. Uh, as a youth on Six God, but also just like in my young journey of being a filmmaker, I've been a part of all sorts of different kinds of workshops and trainings and, and, and you name it. And, uh, and I've always kind of seen how, like, sometimes we have these workshops on the reserve where you come in, these people from who knows where come in all this expensive gear and this knowledge. And they do this cool workshop for three days and then they head out with all their expensive stuff. And you have like this, taste in your mouth to keep making films, but you have no resources to do it. And so I was always my dream to have like a sustainable filmmaking community in Six of Us. So that's what we are, is that we're, we, we bring, or yeah, yeah like, like I don't really think of the collective as me as the leader. I kind of think of it as like, we're, uh, we're all, we all make up the collective. There's about eight of us who are like core members. And, um, and we all bring, you know, like we, emphasize the habit in Six Aga to not send that message that you have to come to the city, you have to go to Vancouver, Toronto, LA, New York to make it in the film industry. You can make films in your backyard. And I think that's a really important um, thing to stress because I think that when we make films in Six Aga, like people are able to see locations they recognize, people they recognize, stories they recognize. And I think it, um, it validates their, their existence and their experiences and it, it tells them that they matter, you know? Um, you know, like what, what we're kind of going on a tangent now, but I think what we're, uh, you know, I was kind of thinking today about uh, truth and reconciliation and, and, and um, the residential school survivors. For a long time, people didn't believe these survivors of what they went through. And it kind of messes with you. You kind of think that, well, did, did that really happen? You know, am I overblown it or, um, but I think these awareness and this acknowledgement and having these days where everybody talks about it, um, it validates those feelings. And I think feelings are like a way, uh, our creators like antibiotics for trauma. And I think when you're able to feel that kind of stuff, it, it, you know, kind of, you know, you release it out of you. And I think that's what films can do too, is when you tell these stories that, uh, it, it, you know, you, you bring it all from in here and in your heart and you, and you, you put it out there and hopefully other people who are maybe holding on to those kind of same kind of feelings can, can release that as well. That's what I really love about the film and arts generally is the way that you can bridge and share between cultures and backgrounds and uh, kind of find a common ground. Um, I'm going to take a few questions from the, uh, the chat box and, uh, Jane Edmondson asked, I'd be interested to hear Trevor's thoughts on what the biggest challenge and greatest opportunity is for Indigenous musicians or filmmakers working today. Yeah, you know, like I think um, I'm still kind of formulating this in my head, but I think I've heard it referenced before as like the brown box, the little brown box. And it's this idea that like, you know, you're just an Indigenous filmmaker, you're just an Indigenous musician. And that, that, you know, that's all you are. And I think when I was growing up as a youth, I would go to these conferences and I would go to these events and, you know, like even being in school, I'd be like, hey, can you write a short story about residential school? Can you, can you write a short story about your, you know, um, just like these, like you're expected to solve all of your people's issues all the time with everything you do. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes I go to these like these film workshops and people will be like, hey, can you teach these kids how to make a film? Also, can you address 
suicide. And I'm like, oh, you know, like that's a heavy, heavy thing to carry and a heavy thing to like, um, you know, pull out of these youth in three days. And I think sometimes, it, you know, and, and on, a, on a bigger scale with film, we're like expected to, um, you know, to as indigenous filmmakers to tell these these really heroin subjects. Um, and that's not all we are. We're not all, um, can you just give me like two seconds? Yes. Yeah. So, okay. And uh, if anybody else has any questions, please add them and I'll get through uh, all of them in the chat. Sorry about that, my uh, skip the dishes this game. <laughs> I'm uh, going to miss out on supper if I don't. Finish. Hopefully it's something good. <laughs> yeah. Uh, anyway, I was I was talking about is that like, sometimes as like indigenous filmmakers, we are uh, expected to, you know, like, I guess, tackle all of the issues in, you know, in, in um, that indigenous people face. And sometimes I've always kind of felt like, I don't know if you've watched the, Spider-Man, like the old Spider-Man with Tobey Maguire, there's that one scene where he's like on a train and he's holding together like his uh, his ropes, his uh, yeah. spider webs. And I kind of feel like that sometimes where I'm holding together, uh, you know, our grandparents and our ancestors way of, you know, oral, oral storytelling and the traditions and the languages, but also looking into the future of, of today's uh, you know, TikTok and, and tweet and this, you know, the next generation and all the tools that we have available to us, but also all the lessons that we have from our grandparents kind of holding together two worlds um, as a filmmaker. And then also just trying to think about what, you know, can we do with all those tools? You know, and like I always tell the, the, the youth in the collective, you can make whatever you want to make. Like we've made sci-fis, we've made post-apocalyptic films, we've made horror comedies, we've made dramas. Um, you don't always have to like tell these really, um, I guess, like, you know, what the mainstream settler population wants you to tell, you know? Right. Uh, and I think, you know, like, you know, why can't we tell a story that, uh, is a, is a, is like a rom-com, but just happens to take place on the reserve or happens to take place with brown people. Why do we have to put it in a category in a box that says this is an indigenous rom-com and indigenous whatever superhero movie why can't we just you know be real people who are alive and thriving and adapting i guess and so like i guess the biggest challenge we face as artists is like is is carrying that pressure of of telling you know of solving all these problems um, but also why can't we just tell you know fun stories that that prove that we're not just the people who are stuck in the past or who are always um downtrodden and, and, and always going through hardship, you know, our, we're very funny and uh, humorous people. So why can't we show that side too? You know, I think in Intertribal, you guys watched it. Um, Olivia talks about, you know, some really, uh, some traditional stories. He always talks about residential school, but uh, then you have Armin's episode where he's talking, you know, he's very humorous, he's very funny. Then you have uh, Darcy's episode where he's talking about his experience with his grandfather and his, and the river. And so like, I think the intertribal, like it's a really, um, I really had a lot of fun making it because it shows a lot of the variety and personalities of our people and, and how the music, you know, it's not just, it's not just powwow. It's not just country. It, it can, uh, you know, our people are, are talented in many genres. And that's what I really appreciated that these are artists working in my community and my region and just a way to kind of familiarize myself with some of the amazing talent that, uh, that we have. Uh, Colleen Devine wanted to ask, how did Trevor choose these amazing musicians? Yeah, so, you know, like uh, me and my producers, uh, Mike Todd and uh, Whitney Oda, like we were very intentional about, um, about just having that variety and having that balance between genres, between perspectives. Um, and yeah, and so like, you know, Armin, I, you know, I grew up, you know, kind of, um, seeing him around the community, playing his guitar all the time, and just kind of seeing him around. The community. He's a bit older than me, so just, I, you know, he has a very like uh, charismatic personality. So I knew he'd be great for this, and I love his music. I love, I love country music. So Armin was a shoe in uh, from the beginning, and I didn't realize I picked Darcy because we wanted to have the the powwow, and he comes from a very storied um, uh, 
legacy of and, and line of uh, drummers. But I didn't know they were childhood friends. And so like when we matched them up together, like they they had a lot of chemistry and they and they, they created a lot of uh, funny moments in, in, in the production. Um, and I liked BB and, and Olivia too, because BB is a bit younger and Olivia, like they kind of seem like similar personalities, but just in different generations. And so it was really cool to see them talk and 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 share experiences. So yeah, so it just it was just uh Mike and myself and Whitney, we just uh brainstormed on, on genres and, and people we might know and then we reached out to them and and having them appear in each other's episodes too was uh something I really, really wanted. It was a dream and vision of mine. But it's a lot to ask for, you know. Um my I had to take my hat off to my production coordinator, uh Caitlin Pantherbone. She really um did all that legwork of arranging schedules and emails and cancellations and you know all worked out in the end but i know it was a lot of stress on her but you know it worked out in the end and this is that word intertribal you know if you've been to a powwow like you know there's the competition dances but there's intertribal um in between song in between competitions or to start the powwow and it's a time for the community to come together and dance together and sing together and, and visit while they well, they, uh, I'm, you know, I miss powers. It's been some time since we've had one, but um, that's what this documentary is. It's the coming together of voices and talents and expressions. And so I think that that name was perfect for this documentary. Fantastic. Katie Jo Rabbit wanted to ask, what is Trevor's Blackfoot name and what advice would he give to a storyteller wanting to start in film? Hmm. Uh, yeah, well, I'll start off my, my name. My name is uh, Sinoxin. And what it means is it's a piece of writing or a piece of, it's a writer or something to do with that. It was a name given to me by my grandpa, Gedekidopi um, uh, Sonny Salway. And it was his great grandfather's uh, um, Blackfoot name. And this guy, Sinoxin, his uh, English name was uh, Samuel Salway. And he was actually a Cree Métis guy who was traveling through Sixaga back in like early 1900s. And he uh, had a relative there named High Eagle, and he stopped in Sitka, and he, um, you know, like it was a wagon and 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 horse days, you know, and so like he stopped there and he found some work, and he was actually burying smallpox victims in camps, and along the way, like he was a, he knew how to write and draw, and so he would write and draw for the elders and kind of provide that service for them, and so they called him Sinox, because that's what he does. And then he ended up dying on six ago from TB and then his uh, wife passed away also from TB. And so like he, his kids were orphaned in six ago and that's, you know, why we're there today. But anyway, this guy, Sinoxin, you know, that's, that's why I carry that name. That's where I, I got it from. And I take great honor in carrying, um, but you know, so it's, it's a fitting name for me as well to, to be someone who preserves and tells these stories. Uh, and my advice for, um, for people who want to get into film or, or to be in this industry is just to like keep creating and just keep always be doing something. You know, when I came back from film school in uh, what 2013, I was 21. And I, I had a lot of friends in Vancouver who were telling me to stay, you know, keep making films out here. And it is true. There's, there's a thriving community of, of uh, filmmakers out there, especially indigenous filmmakers. And they told me, if you go back home, you're never going to make it. You're going to probably end up, you know, <laughs> getting a real job. And I, but I really missed being home. I really missed my people, my friends, my family. And so I came home anyway. And I just kind of had this really stubborn nature of like not giving up on projects or just filming things regardless of budget or equipment. And that's what I did early on in my career. It's just like I made things. Uh, I was really resourceful and I was just always making stuff. I th you know, and then that's a value I learned from my grandpa is that not just like talk about things like, like be about it and do it. And I think a lot of people like to talk about, oh, I got this project, I got this idea. And they just talk about it and they think that's enough. They think that just talking about it is enough. And for me, like, I don't really like to talk about my projects, not because I'm secret about them, but it's because they're not done yet. I'm not, you know, like, I think you need to like actually put in the work to, to giving those projects life. Um, and you know, like, I, I hope, hopefully my, what I've accomplished to date in my career, um, 
you know, speaks to that because like I can talk to them blue in the face about representation and that, you know, um, indigenous people in front of the cameras and our image and all that kind of stuff matters, but what am I doing about it? And having the not be collective and then creating those opportunities back home and supporting those voices and those stories, that's me doing something about it. Um, and you know, like I, you know, like I don't, um, yeah, so that's something I, I don't like to talk too much about things. I like to actually put in the, the work to do it. And so like, that's a message I would tell um, young filmmakers. And I, and I tell people back, like the collective as well, is don't, don't talk about it, be about it. Um, yeah, and you know, and, and, and you know, like the young filmmakers I've been, I've been mentoring so far have, um, you know, they're, they're just eager to, to make films. And I think our people aren't, this idea that we're lazy is totally garbage. We're not lacking in talent or work ethic. We're lacking in opportunity. And I think bringing the Nopi Collective back home and bringing these opportunities back home, it, it you know, we made six films out, out of that. And they, these films have gone on to um, LA Skins Festival in Hollywood, California, it went on to Maori Land in New Zealand, American Indian Film Festival in San Francisco. And so there's legs and there's room for our, there's, there's, there's hunger for indigenous stories out there. We just got to put these resources in the right places. Um, I'm, it was interesting. I was going to ask you about where uh, some of these Nopi films had been shared. Um, is there any platform or any place that uh, people from our own region can view these films? Yeah, actually, you know, you can look up uh, most of them. I think maybe three of them were on Vimeo uh, on, under my name, Trevor Solway. I'm looking to get like a, a central hub where we can have all the Nopi Collective films, you know, live like a website. Um, and I'm still like, we're still under construction. Uh, I used to code myself, but you know, and I'm, every time I code again, I have to reteach myself. So I might just yeah. kind of do a, hire somebody to do that instead. Um, but yeah, we're, we're in the future, like hopefully by now this year, we're gonna have a central hub where all the Nopi Collective films will live. We have four right now that are done and we just, we shot one in the spring and we just wrapped on one this past weekend. And so uh, we have two that are still being edited that'll be done probably early next year. All right, I, I look forward to looking them up and uh, they sound really interesting. I'm a film buff myself, so I can't wait to watch them. Yeah, I'll just name drop, name drop them really quick. We have, our first film was called Tales from the Res. It's a horror comedy show, it should be, it's on, it's on Vimeo. Uh, the second one is called uh, Gai. It's like this post-apocalyptic, kind of like a Mad Max type film. Okay. Um, it means meat in Blackfoot, Gai. And the third one is called A Night Out. It's kind of like a uh, a uh, super bad, you know, but takes place on the reserve, like kind of like a teenage party movie. Our fourth one is called uh, Niksuka Wakes. It's like a live action animation film. And then our, our next two, uh, I'll reveal more about them when they get closer to being finished. Fantastic. Um, it's been a pleasure just uh, listening to you talk. We're really insightful and uh, honest and uh, authentic. It's just uh, wonderful. And hopefully we can do uh, partner in other ways in the future. I'd, I'd be honored to do that. I'm not seeing any more questions coming up in the chat. So is there any kind of closing words that you would uh, like to share with the viewers? Yeah, you know, like I guess like today, and, and this whole week I've been kind of thinking about, you know, this day that we're, we're uh, honoring the National Day of uh, Truth and Reconciliation. And, you know, I've been just kind of listening with open ears and just kind of taking it in. Uh, I haven't really been saying much, but I think what I've been kind of, you know, meditating on is that, um, you know, I, it reminds me of this video I, I watched, you know, we're honoring and we're remembering children. I watched this video on social media where this young lady was talking about uh, this young girl was talking about having no clean drinking water on her reserve and she was saying that she feels like a, a ghost like something that was put in a shoebox and tucked under the bed and she feels like they, she was just kind of forgotten you know like how how can these remote communities have no drinking water how, how can a first world country like Canada not you know even care to make this discussion and so I was kind of thinking about this on a on a on a bigger scale level as well, you know, when you think about all these residential schools, like I said, people didn't believe these survivors for a long time, and when you don't, when you do that, it's like gaslighting, you know, like you're just kind of saying, oh, you're making it up, oh, you're you're blowing it up, but oh, it wasn't that bad. Oh, it happened a long time ago. When you say stuff like that, you cause doubt in people's 
experiences and, 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 and existence. And I think when you look at like sports teams, logos, Chicago Blackhawks, um, Cleveland Indians, Washington Redskins, that Indian head and that beads and feathers and that, that really antiquated way of looking at Indian indigenous people, I guess, I guess I'll say Indians, cause that's what they called us. You know, they, they pan indigenous everybody to be bees and feathers. And even that is, is, is putting us in a time capsule and making us relics of the past. And I think that's what our people sometimes they believe that themselves. They think that they're these ghosts, these uh, hungry ghosts that they, um, yeah, that they're that they're always kind of searching. And so when when we make films, if it's this film or an opera collective films or anything I've done in my own career, it's not. I want to restore those feelings of of that people are alive and that our our culture, Blackfoot culture, is thriving and adapting and evolving. That we're not we're not talking about our people in past tense. Um, that we're if we're present tense. And you know, having days like today, like yeah, it's awareness and it's um, and it's an acknowledgement. But for me, what I'm taking it as is that it's um, it's uh, it you know it having those feelings acknowledged. It it says to me that you know I want to say I want to say that uh, you know I can make a difference too. You know, and hopefully. There's an you know indigenous youth out there who are struggling with self esteem or or confidence, you know you can make a difference too, and if you're a settler with a lot of deep shame and you feel like there's nothing you can do, you know you can make a difference too, and so having this day of awareness and acknowledgement, you know it's important to learn stuff too, but also you know it's it's also important to be aware that you can do something about it, um, you can make a difference. Um, you know, and in your small everyday lives, maybe don't follow somebody around a grocery store, you know, <laughs> maybe um, have a little more compassion. You see somebody on the street, maybe give them a few bucks. Um, you know, maybe, I don't know, there's, there's, there's you know, <laughs> there's 94 calls of action that you can do. Uh, I don't have to name all of them, but, you know, they, you, you can make a difference somehow. And that's yeah. what I'm thinking today to, to, to say, I guess. Yeah, reflect, time to reflect today and act today and tomorrow. I I really appreciate it, Trevor. It's been a, a pleasure meeting you and uh, you're so close. I hopefully will be able to meet up at some point. Yeah, definitely. Thanks, Darcy. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody for tuning in. Cheers. Yeah.